Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you for being here and being on time and um, turning out. We're really excited. Um, so we have Alessandra Biaggi. She's the Democratic New York State Senator in her home district of the Bronx and Westchester. And she's the chair of the Revived Ethics and Internal Governance Committee. The granddaughter of Italian immigrants who lived in Hunts Point, she's the fourth generation of her family to live in District 34. Within her first two months in office, Senator Biaggi chaired New York State's first public hearings in 27 years in sexual harassment in the workplace and led the charge in New York to pass legislation that strengthens protections for survivors and holds employers accountable for addressing sexual misconduct. Yay. In a joint effort with her colleagues in the Democratic Conference, the Senator worked to pass transformational legislation, including tenant-centered housing reforms, bold climate change initiatives, unprecedented criminal justice reform, comprehensive workplace protections, and expansive legislation making it easier to vote. <laughs> Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Khan, both, both Columbia professors, are the co-authors of the new book, Sexual Citizens, a landmark study of sex, power, and assault on campus, published by W.W. W. Norton. Together, they co-directed the ethnographic research described in the book. That work was realized as part of Columbia's Sexual Health Initiative to Foster Transformation, or SHIFT, co-directed by Jennifer and clinical psychologist Claude Ann Mellons. Many of you may recall seeing SHIFT profiled by Gia Tolentino in The New Yorker in February of 2018. A review in Science described sexual citizens as profoundly eye-opening, and we are delighted to welcome them and Senator Biaggi to our shared community for a conversation about campus sexual assault and what all of us as family members, parents, and voters can do to prevent it. Our hosts tonight are Markers for Democracy and the Downtown Nasty Women Social Group. Markers for Democracy is a grassroots community of activists who are dedicated to doing what we can to save our democracy. We accomplish this through writing postcards to voters, reading for resistance, engaging speakers, and raising money through our giving circle to flip state legislators. We're 450 strong and growing. The Downtown Nasty Women Social Group is a grassroots activist group formed in the aftermath of the 2016 election. We've organized, written, called, texted, tweeted, marched, and raised money through our giving circle to promote progressive values and advance and defend our democracy. Before they begin the conversation, I want to note for those listening that Jennifer and Seamus's discussion of the book contains descriptions of actual sexual assaults as students experienced them. This material can be hard to listen to, and we know that in every room, virtual or not, there are survivors. I'll drop the RAIN National Assault um, Hotline number in the chat window. Please take care of yourselves and know that you are not alone. And the hotline number is 1-800-656-HOPE or 1-800-656-4673. And with that, please welcome New York State Senator Alessandra Biaggi and Professors Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Khan. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I Listen, I always want to begin um, any uh, talk that I'm doing or part of or conversation that I'm part of with a moment of gratitude. So let's begin with that. Um, thank you to Ellen Bender from Markers for Democracy and Lisa Goldenberg from Downtown Nasty Women Social Group for organizing this event. And of course, we would not be doing this event if it were not for the two stars of the show. Um, so I want to thank Professor Jennifer Hirsch and Professor Seamus Khan for joining us today to speak about their work. Um, in my very short time since I've been in the legislature, I was uh, sworn in January of 2019. Um, I have thought a lot about how we can shift our systems of law and, and really participate in transformational change, um, which were largely written decades ago, a lot of our laws by men. A lot of women were not at the table, and so our laws reflect that. Um, the reason for participating um, today is because I, I want to make sure that we carry the conversation forward um, and that our laws continue to shift to reflect the reality of trauma, 
and the nuances of sexual assault. Um, but the reality is that transforming our culture is a much bigger task than just changing the laws. It takes a lot more than that. College campuses are a space where many people learn about sex, consent, and power. The norms that students learn and see reinforced on, campus sh on campuses shape our culture for years to come. Um, your book, professors, if you haven't already read it, for those of you who are participating tonight, this is the book, Sexual Citizens. It is amazing. Pick up a copy and read it because you will not be disappointed. Your book, Professors, focuses on the social roots, roots of sexual assault and how we can shift the conversation from adjudication and punishment to prevention, which is key. It's key to making transformational change. So I am excited. I am actually like thrilled. I've been looking forward to this conversation all week um, for both of you to share your insight and to help us think about this issue in new ways. So let's begin. Um, I'm going to just, the way that it's going to, that this conversation is going to um, unfold, just for those of you who are participating, is I'm going to ask questions and we're just going to engage in a conversation and then hopefully we're going to get to the Q&A, um, some questions that you submit um, outside of the questions that we already have and you can have your voices heard as well. So let's begin. Um, so professors, what is this book about? What is, tell us about Sexual Citizens. Um, what do you hope will be the big take, take home or takeaway from reading this book? The big takeaway is that when we talk about sexual assault, we need to talk about prevention. Most of the national conversation, um, driven in large part by, by advocates um, and some leadership from our prior federal government, um, the focus was on adjudication and um, a sort of a notion of campuses as, as a hunting ground with sociopathic perpetrators. And um, we have a totally different take. Those things are important, but most assaults are not reported. And so we look upstream and we say, instead of focusing on punishment, let's, let's redesign campuses and let's think about the social changes that we need to, to make so that there are fewer assaults. Um, I'll tell you a story. Um, so Austin was a sweet man. Um, the, the only really steamy sex scene in the book features Austin and his girlfriend on a hot summer night. I'm not gonna, that's not the story I'm gonna tell right now. Um, but he was, he was kind of guy who cared about his girlfriend's pleasure. They had developed a series of nicknames for the kinds of orgasms that she had. So he seemed, as we would say in my family, kind of menschy. Um, and yet he told us another story in the interview of a time freshman year when he'd been shuttled into someone else's room in the way that college students are, that his, his uh, roommate wanted to be alone with his girlfriend and he ended up late at night in a room with a girl who was really drunk and said to him, I don't want to do anything. But he was, um, he was really anxious because he felt like everybody had more sexual experience than he did. And so he got in her bed and he started to touch her body. And then he thought to himself, Nah, this isn't the thing. And as he recounted this story to us years later, um, he, he told the story, but he didn't call it assault. He called it something like a kind of weird experience. And then later in the interview, um, he was asked, well, what is sexual assault? And he said, well, sexual assault is when you touch someone without their permission in a sexual way. And then he paused and his eyes welled up and he was like, fuck me. Like he was really distressed when he realized that that was what he had done because it didn't at all make sense to him with the kind of person that he had grown into being. And so in the book, we look, what is this, what is the society that produced Austin, that, that put him in that moment where he could disregard another person or see them as an object to acquire sexual experience? Professor Khan, do you have anything to add to that? We'll, we'll end up filling out that story as we go along, kind of returning to it again and again to try and make sense of it, given the sort of concepts of the book. You know, I, so Professor Hirsch, you, what you just said was actually, the two things that you said that really touched me. Number one was the redesigning of a system, which, you know, this is probably was not even on your radar when you wrote this book, but this pandemic right now and the moment that we're in actually 
provides for us this portal of transformation. I think many people who are, you know, part of this conversation tonight watching could probably say, well, you know, the world has been transforming, right? We have the Me Too movement. We have all of these different um, mo movements and momentum happening. And yet the change is still not happening fast enough, right? And so the redesigning of the system is essential. And this, this pandemic actually gives us that portal of transformation because we're going to enter, we're going to exit out of this, this pandemic into a world that we don't really recognize. And so that means we get to recreate it. And this is one of the most important frontiers that we can recreate. So that's really something that just stuck out to me. And also, the, you know, the, what is, what is sexual assault? You know, not having the words or understanding that information is key. And I know we're going to talk more about that in the conversation, but this is why um, understanding the frontier of sexuality is so important. And so thank you for that, really. The book is centered around three very big ideas. And if you've read it already, you already know what they are. Um, sexual citizenship, sexual projects, and sexual geographies. So can either of you define these three ideas for us so that we can get a little more understanding into your thinking? And how do they help us understand sexual assault? Sure. So um, sexual projects is the answer to the question, what is sex for? Um, people have sex for a lot of different reasons. For pleasure is a really obvious one, but also to connect with another person or to increase their status within a group, to give a loved one comfort. And there are lots of different reasons why people have sex. And in order to understand sexual assault, we argue that you need to know why it is that people are trying to have the kinds of sex that they're having and sometimes end up assaulting people in the process. The idea of sexual citizenship is that we need to teach young people that they have the right to say yes and the right to say no to sex and that they have an obligation to recognize that the people they're having sex with have equivalent rights. And then sexual geographies is the idea that space matters. Um, space matters for power. Uh, in, well, space matters because of power, but space matters for a whole host of reasons. Um, so if we think about a dorm room that has a desk, a chair, a bureau, and a bed, and we imagine two young people sitting somewhere together in that dorm room, where are they going to sit? They're going to sit on the bed together. And like it or not, beds have social meaning. And so the idea is to think with these three concepts as just a framework for understanding sexual assault. So I'll tell you another story it's of Scott and Lucy. And Lucy had um, been kind of sheltered before ending up at Columbia. She'd gone to boarding school and, you know, she kind of had a plan for what she wanted when she got to campus. She wanted to party a little bit. She wanted to meet some boys. She wanted to make out. She wanted to lose her virginity. And, you know, on an early Saturday in the fall semester, she sort of found herself at a bar with a very good friend of hers and, you know, they got into the bar because bars let women in um, uh, pretty easily, even if they have really bad fake IDs. And she and her friend ended up sort of meeting a couple guys, making out with them a little. And then she went back with Scott to his uh, dorm. And this is a story that's really a classic kind of sexual assault story in terms of our own imagination. So she and Scott went back actually to his fraternity house and her friend, um, texted her and said, where are you? Where are you? Because she'd had the bystander intervention training and came rushing up after them. And Lucy and Scott and her friend ended up on the second floor of the fraternity house. Scott made the two women some drinks or girls as um, a lot of men end up calling college uh, women in their lives. And um, uh, Lucy's friend immediately passed out. She hadn't been drugged. She, drugged. she was just very drunk. Um, and Scott and Lucy, Scott asked Lucy, do you want to go upstairs? And they went upstairs together um, and they got into Scott's room and they started making out. Everything for Lucy was coming together in this moment. She'd sort of met a senior guy, a guy with a lot of status on campus. She was making out with him. She was sort of excited about what was happening until he started to take her pants off. And she said, no, don't. And he said to her, it's okay. And then he raped her. And um, in this story, you know, the, the classic way of looking at this is Scott is a sociopath. And Scott may have been a sociopath. We didn't interview Scott. We only talked to Lucy. But there are a lot of other things that we might use to make sense of this. 
So, you know, one of the things that we might think of about is Scott's sexual project, where sex was something for him to accomplish rather than for him to do with another person. Scott's denial of Lucy's sexual and citizenship. When she said, no, don't, and he said, it's okay, he effectively erased her mm -hmm. and spaced. They were in Scott's fraternity house, surrounded by his friends. Lucy was relatively alone, and there was an enormous amount of power that Scott had. And so we think that this sort of framework can help us see all kinds of things that are happening in this classic moment with Scott and Lucy that maybe we wouldn't have seen otherwise. That is a very powerful story. And I think that um, for anybody who's watching, that probably resonates um, significantly. And I think that when you're going to college, it's kind of fascinating to me as, you know, I, I am a young person, yes, and college was probably 15 years ago at this point. But when you're leaving high school and you're going to college, there really isn't any type of discussion about what to expect, especially when it comes to drinking or sex. There's it, The conversation doesn't really happen. Really where you get this information is from either your family or from the social threads and the fabric and your friends. And I think that being aware of these spaces actually makes us better citizens and also allows us to know and to identify what's happening to us or around us. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Let's move into uh, a little, a, 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 we'll shift a little bit into the topic. So as a legislator, um, you know, I've thought a lot about um, what we can do, not to just move the conversation around sexual assault, but change our laws for the better. And I, I know earlier I mentioned and talked about how it's not just laws that change culture, culture changes laws, it's really everything altogether. Um, in 2015, New York State passed what is known as and what is referred to as the Enough is Enough law. Um, at the time, the legislation was heralded as nation leading. Um, but five years later, right, we're now in 2020, um, many schools are still failing to comply with the standards. Um, you talk a lot about in the book uh, the role that each of us play in preventing sexual assault. What role do you see legislation playing in that process? I think enough and uh, enough is enough in particular um, was symbolically really important. I think about my own years in college when the only moment that sexual assault emerged into the public conversation was the annual Take Back the Night March. And then it was just sort of pushed back into the margins and, and into the silence. And so um, to see Governor Cuomo and Lady Gaga up on stage that day, that was a really significant moment. But um, I think the content of that legislation, you know, it, so New York became a state that required schools to instruct students in affirmative consent. And I remember being in a meeting with um, our institutional advisors at Columbia and saying to um, the person from the Office of the General Counsel that, that, yeah, the students all take the class in affirmative consent, but the way that they actually do consent it is closer to, you know, a text that says, you up, yep, and like, that's it, or do you want to go back to my room, and, you know, she, poor woman, like, fell off her chair, because she felt like she was failing, and so um, our A-game in public health is, is not telling people to act better, it's changing the context so that it's easier for them to act in ways that don't harm each other, and so I think that um, legislation certainly plays a role, particularly if it includes funding. I think we need to remember that most college students in America don't go to private colleges. They go to community colleges or they go to state colleges. And so to lay requirements on higher education without providing them with the resources to do it just amplifies inequality. And a big message in the book is that we need to start earlier. Um, one of the papers from the survey that that this uh, that the ethnography was that was part of this bigger project found that um, a quarter of women had experienced an assault before college. So if we if the first moment of prevention that they're getting is freshman orientation week, it's too late. Mm -hmm. And that same paper also found that women who had ex who had gotten sex education that included training in how to say no to sex they didn't want to have, which is not abstinence-only sex education, it's just non-terrible sex education, those women were half as likely to be raped in college. 
So for all you stats people, that is a really big effect size. It's, it's essentially equivalent to a flu shot. Now, the flu shot is not 100%, it's about 50%, but if everybody gets a flu shot, we, we build up herd immunity. And so when we think about sex education, sex education as probably the most important next step legislatively for the Me Too agenda. And not just for, for college, but think about it as workforce development, right? Like we have 12 years to teach people to interact respectfully with their coworkers. And, and it's the, we have a much better shot at doing it then than by giving them a set of PowerPoint slides to click through. I mean, that's, that's a perfect segue to the second part of the question that I have, because you ta there's, there's a lot of conversation about um, like individual responsibility, right? Like each and every single one of us is individually responsible um, for prevention. And so I'm curious what that means uh, for everyone who's listening. How can they be responsible? How can they make sure that they're part of the solution um, as opposed to being part of the problem? So I think I would like everybody to um, make sure that their legislators support comprehensive sex ed. I really feel like that's a way that they that people can be part of the solution. But then um, families are children's first and most important teachers, right? It is it is parents' job to raise little savage beasts into people who can interact in the world, right? And so when your your child grabs something you say, don't grab, use your words. That's a sexual assault prevention message. We just need to connect the dots there. There's so many things that parents teach children about how to move their bodies safely through the world. And the whole, the whole sort of journey of parenting is letting your child take over their own body. But think about how much time most parents spend on oral hygiene and how little time they spend on sexual health. So I think there's a role for parents. Um, I feel very strongly that there's also a role for faith communities. I was lucky to be a member of a faith community that has a really substantial um, adolescent engagement program that is focused around intimacy and relationships. And if the role of religion is to teach people to be good people in the world, then not assaulting people should certainly be part of that. Um, really every single institution that touches young people's lives is an opportunity for teaching them to be respectful of the people around them. I think that was so well said. And the fact of the matter is that each and every one of us has communities that we're part of, and we will know when we have reached a successful place when, when everyone is actually part of the prevention and part of the solution, as opposed to part of the problem, right? Even being quiet can be part of the problem. And I see this, you know, as a legislator in a place like Albany, which is really, you know, it's, it's changing, but it's not changed, right? So we're still pushing a lot to make sure that we can actually make it a place that everybody feels safe. And being there, you know, there's a lot of times where I look around the room and, and I, you know, I oftentimes get my wrist slapped. I'm sure that you both know that, right, for saying things that people are thinking, but they're like, why did you say that? Because I know, right, I know, I know at least five people are thinking it, but we have to speak up and we have to use our voices. And a lot of times I get it. We just don't have the tools or the words. We don't know how to even access the communication point to be part of it. So having the education is important. And this is a perfect segue um, to a bill that I co-sponsor in the Senate um, that would essentially require every single school to provide comprehensive sexuality education or comprehensive sex ed is, you know, the shorthand for it. Um, and with the main goal, okay, to just empower and educate students to make responsible decisions, which we can all agree on, um, about their sexual health and to also destigmatize um, talking about the physical, the emotional, and the social aspects of human sexuality. I would love um, for you to talk a little bit about why comprehensive sex education is so important for preventing sexual assault. Um, and you know, I will tie a, I'll tie a little bow on it at the end with a piece of legislation that I um, really had a hard time passing last year, just to really put a a pinpoint on the fact that even though we see progress, there's a lot of people behind the scenes who are afraid. They're afraid to talk about these topics. They're afraid of what's going to happen to them. Um, when I chaired the sexual harassment hearings, I, I cannot tell you the fear that came out of that the halls of Albany. And it was 
really discouraging, but also it signaled to me, we have to do this, right? This is something we have to do because in order to transform that culture, we have to keep pushing the boundaries. And so I would love to just hear a little bit about why, you know, comprehensive sex ed is just so essential to making sure that we get this right. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to say one just little side note. I mean, I also think your own story and the story of our research points to the importance of having women in position of power. Um, the fact that we were able to do this research project at Shift of Shift um, that Jennifer and Claude led was because one of the senior administrators at the university was a woman who immediately saw the value in supporting our research. And I'm not sure that the same thing would have happened with other male administrators. I, I hate to say it. But I think, you know, Jennifer earlier said, you know, that that pointed to the research about how for women who are taught refusal skills, you know, they, they experience rape at half the rate in, um, in college and universities. And that's really important. But we also need to recognize that like men are committing the vast majority of rapes and of sexual assaults and that something needs to be done about this and sex and, you know, an education in shame um, and in punishment is in our view unlikely to be super successful. Like we don't think we can punish our way out of this problem. We think we can educate our way partially out of the problem. Maybe not all of the way out, but a lot of the way. And so, you know, I don't know if you ever saw the T video, which was this sort of classic video about consent where, you know, sort of said like, if someone asks you to make tea and you make tea and they, and they say they don't want tea, don't force them to drink the tea. And, you know, instead of this sort of very cute video, but one of the challenges with that video was that it was degendered and it was degendered in ways to be really inclusive, to try and make, you know, people with different gender identities and different sexualities feel seen. But in some ways that fundamentally misses the deep ways in which gender and power are intimately a part of sexual assault. But I think if we take a step back and we just think about like driving, right? Um, and it's one of the, the analogies that we use a lot in the book. Think about all of the work that we do to make sure that young people know how to drive safely. There's driver's ed. We require that they have a permit for a period of time, but it's not just about the young people themselves. We build cars with a range of things that make driving safer, like seat belts, and we insist that they get worn. We've actually changed the physical environment. So there are curb cuts that protect pedestrians. You know, we, we trim trees to make sure that like stop signs can be seen. There is so much social effort that goes in to making sure that young people know how to drive safely, but there's really not the same equivalent effort when it comes to sex. And it's partially, you know, a, an old kind of American sort of puritanical story but it's more than that. Um, you know, if you think about the sex ed that we provide today, so many of the young people that we spoke to in our research joked that it wasn't sex ed, it was their sexual diseases course. It was about the risks of having sex, about how they could get pregnant or someone could get pregnant or how they could get an STI and how that was going to be a huge problem. It was about sort of the shame and the risk associated with sex. No one, almost no one told us a story where somebody sat them down and said, you know, sex is going to be a really important part of your life. It's going to be a way in which you connect to some of the people who are the most important to you. You need to think about what it is you want out of that part of your life and who you want to be within it. To return to our driving analogy, we biologize sex ed in a kind of really technical way. So we teach people about like, ovaries and fallopian tubes and things like that. And don't get me wrong, you know, biology, it's important. People should learn it. But like when we teach people to drive, we don't say like, this is the spark plug and here is its role in the internal combustion engine. Right? <laughs> like it, it, it is not what we do. Instead, we say like, what does it mean to drive defensively, to drive safely, to be attentive to what other people are doing on the road? And so we need to start thinking about this in, in that kind of way. So, you know, it's so, I was laughing not because of what you're saying is funny, but because it's almost like we have it backwards. 
I almost wish that I would learn about the spark plug and, and how the tire runs and the engine runs so that when I my car breaks down and I go to bring it in, I'm not ripped off because they tell me it's $1,000 instead of $100 because it's one little, you know, turn screw that needs to go in there versus, right, our bodies. It's like this is the vessel that we carry our life through. And we should know how to protect it, and we should know also how to bring it pleasure. But more importantly, we should know how to protect it and each other. So it's really, it's fascinating how we've designed this world. And I really do think a lot of it comes down to discomfort. I, I really do. Because, you know, I, I, as you're talking, I'm thinking about all the times last year that, you know, we were in the spaces to recreate and redesign, right? Because that's really a theme of sexual citizens. Like, we're redesigning this whole system. And when we were talking about the Child Victims Act, right? Child Victims Act in New York, it, it just stalled for 10 years because of different lobbying groups and efforts to try to pre prevent it from coming to the floor. The Child Victims Act extended the statute of limitation so that you know if you were abused as a child, you had a look back for a year and you were able to actually use the court of law as a place for justice if you wanted to. Additionally, Aaron's Law, which I had to literally, I had to push that boulder up the hill and it was almost not going to make it and we pushed it up and it's it's doing you know it, it's not the sex education it's child sexual abuse prevention right because keeping those two things separate allow us to create children and then ultimately a society that knows how to protect themselves and in pushing that bill forward, I just, I really watched with like my mouth open where people were so uncomfortable. They didn't even want to say the word sex. And we're talking about grown legislators in the room and it's not to shame them, but it's just to, to highlight, right? How much work we still have to do and why it is so important to have sex education, um, prevention, and all of the type of education that can make sure that we actually are creating the society that we are aiming for. So thank you so much for that. That was just amazing. So with that, I mean, this kind of leads us to, you know, vulnerability and being open and, and, and really honest about what we're going through. So how do we have those open and those honest conversations about sex, sexual assault, um, particularly with teenagers um, and young adults? And how can we really shift the culture of shame and especially the culture of shame around assault? That is the thing that keeps so many people silent i mean the silence is a real thing we um when we spoke with students so many of the stories that they told us were not stories that they had told they certainly hadn't reported but sometimes they hadn't even told their friends because um most frequently the assaults happen within a friend group and so they did they don't want to cause social disruption in a way that is sort of parallel to the reluctance of a lot of survivors of child sexual abuse to you know the students friends on campus become their substitute families and they don't want to to rock the boat or they're afraid that people will side with everyone else um i'll tell you uh, two more stories so i think eddie's story really illustrates to us what a bad job society, American society does in teaching people how to have sex without harming people. It was so striking. You know, people who had intentionally harmed someone were not the ones who showed up to be interviewed, right? And so the stories that we heard from the point of view of the assaulter were stories um, of, you could think about them as sort of unintentional harm. In So Eddie, was was aggrieved as he recounted this story to us. He had been invited to a sorority formal. Um, he was in season for his sport. He had practiced the next day. He wasn't so crazy about the girl, but it was a really high prestige sorority. So he went along. He wasn't drinking. She drank a lot. He didn't really know what to do with her at the end of the night because it was pouring down rain. He couldn't figure out how to get her back to her room or his room. And so he finally just brought her back to his room because he wanted to go to sleep. And, and then, and this is crazy, he described to us having sex with her as she went in and out of consciousness, which is rape. And he seemed to feel that he was paying a social debt. He didn't, I mean, maybe, again, maybe he was a sociopath, unknown. But what it really seemed like was that nobody had taught him how to think about sex as something that you do with someone else to be connected to them as opposed to just an obligation. Um, or another story, um, Gwen. Gwen was a, a beautiful, 
young woman who, when she started campus, um, sort of slid right into the uh, the New York club scene. And she was much more into the guys she would meet at those clubs, sort of like B-list actors and not very famous um, athletes. And she didn't want to have sex with them. And so she would go back to their room, their hotel rooms. And she had this whole strategy, um, which she described as giving them a blowjob to get out of there. And she felt like that was the price she had to pay for a safe exit. Um, she described being assaulted on campus by um, a senior. Her friends encouraged her. They're like, you really should try going out with Columbia guys. So she, she didn't, wasn't so into that, but the senior asked her out. She was still a freshman, so she figured she would try it. Um, and she had sort of in her mind this whole like first base, second base, third base scenario for a couple of dates. But she wasn't, she wasn't that into him. They, so she went back to his room and she thought maybe they would make out. And he had a different idea. And she managed to talk him down. So they were just, he was just, just going to sleep over. And she was awakened in the night by him humping her leg. And she was like, that's gross. What are you doing? And so she got him to stop. And then when she told her friends about it, they were like, you were assaulted. And she totally rejected that. She's like, I was not assaulted. It was just a gross thing. It's not a big deal. I'm fine. She didn't experience taking on a survivor identity as, as useful. And then it wasn't until sort of this third experience where um, a guy she knew from the club scene who she described as gorgeous, 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 like many gorgeouses, um, came uptown, brought some pot. They went to Morningside Park to get high. Um, people had moved out, so she was already alone in her dorm room. And they went back to her room and, and he commanded her to give him a blowjob. And she was like, no, I'm not doing that. And he's like, well, I'm going to tell the security guard we're smoking pot. And she's like, well, I'm going to tell the security guard you're trying to rape me. Um, so she, but she was scared because she was alone there with him. And, but I think it's so significant. It was her room. It was her university. He was a visitor. She knew the rules and she knew she would be protected. So she got him out of there. And that was the moment that she described as sort of, realizing her sexual citizenship, realizing that she didn't need to give anybody a blowjob to get out of anywhere. But our focus is not just on Gwen and on her self-realization, but on all the men around her who assumed over and over and over again that they had the right to have access to her body. And I think if we only stop at those men and at vilifying them, then that's not really so solution-oriented, right? Like we can, I mean, I feel angry. I feel angry when I tell this story on her behalf, but um, who taught those men to ignore women or treat them like objects? And so like, that's what takes us back mm -hmm. to a social analysis and to thinking like, okay, here we go again with the families and the faith communities and the comp comprehensive sex ed. Like people are formed and their values are shaped by the societies around them and we need to do a better job with that. That is you know, the story that you just told, it made me angry. And then, and then it also, it makes me feel empowered in a way because she knew the rules, right? The, 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 the important part of so much of this is being empowered with the knowledge. But the thing is right now, knowledge is like a luxury item and it should be something that everybody knows, you know, just like, you know, I, I oftentimes think about, you know, in pop culture or, it, and I, it's, not really pop culture, but if you turn on like SVU, right? Chances are you're going to find a scene where a cop says you have the right to remain silent. Anything that you say can be used against you in a court of law. Why do we all know that? Why is that something that we could recite with our eyes closed? Because we've seen it on TV. We've read about it in school. And it's something that just constantly shows up in society. And very much what we're talking about here, becoming a sexual citizen, really understanding what's going on. It cannot be a privilege to have this information and it cannot be, you know, the price that you have to pay. I, that line also is so powerful because, you know, I'm, I'm a state senator in the New York State Legislature and for so many years, right? And still we don't have 50-50 in terms of gender, right? We don't have 50% women, 50% men. And it makes a difference to have more women at the table. It does. It informs the policies. But for so long, right, the price that women and and 
for so long and still it still happens okay it's still happening as we speak the price that women have, have had to pay to get into politics has been almost too high to the point where they've left right and so during the sexual harassment hearings last year so much of um what i faced every day was making sure even the witness list, okay, the order of the witnesses made them afraid. Like, they did not want all of the young women and the, and the men from the sexual harassment working group, which was a group of former uh, staffers that worked for the New York State Legislature who had been either assaulted, uh, harassed, raped. They didn't want them to all testify together. Why? Because they knew how powerful it would be, and they also knew that there were still sitting members who had actually participated in that. And, you know, at the very last second, you know, sometimes these things in life, these opportunities open, and you have to just jump through the window. This is just how it is. And I realized that I could get them to just all testify together, and so I just said, let's do it. And they looked at me as if I was crazy, but I knew it would actually make a difference. And it was the most powerful moment of the entire hearing. And it was when we learned about the importance of gender, the importance of race, the importance of power dynamics. And this is how we have to be able to learn, holding these spaces where we might feel uncomfortable, but also to make sure we understand the inequalities. And so, you know, this leads to, to our last question before we get to the questions for the audience, um, which is really about intersectionality. So how do racial and class inequality intersect with sexual assault? And how should we take race and class into account when we think about preventing sexual ass assault and shifting culture? Yeah, you know, Jennifer and I really try and build on a very classic feminist understanding of sexual assault in relationship to gender and power. But you know, it's important to recognize that gender is not the only power inequality on campus. And there are so many other dimensions of power inequalities that are essential to understanding what it is that's happening. You know, every single black woman that we spoke to told us a story of unwanted sexualized touching. Every single one. And that was very much about, you know, it, it, that was an experience of sexual assault that was founded in just a fundamental disrespect for black women's bodies. And, you know, we also heard about the ways in which um, black and Latino students um, experienced a sort of unique set of risks because of their experiences of campus spaces as primarily white spaces. And this really returns us to sexual geography where, you know, this, the control over space on campus, the control over party spaces, for example, it's often white men who have control over those spaces. So as an example, um, you know, Greek life has a very interesting national rule, um, and interesting is a kind way of putting it, that says that fraternities can serve alcohol and sororities cannot. And that effectively gives men control over the distribution of alcohol and control over party spaces, particularly that freshmen tend to go to. It's a, sort of a huge problem. But that sort of fundamental whiteness of those spaces also drives some people off campus. So I just, I'm going to end with sort of two stories. Um, the first is the story of a woman named Charisma who, you know, experienced this racialized campus landscape as kind of alienating. And she found that like, you know, the, the, the guys on campus just really, she felt weren't particularly attracted to her. And to be honest, she wasn't particularly into them as that much uh, either. Um, you know, making jokes about vineyard vines and, and, and things like that, that just, it wasn't her style. Um, and so she met a guy through her roommate um, who lived out in Brooklyn and she went out to see him uh, one evening and the, it was like a disaster from the start because, you know, it was like pouring rain. The subway wasn't really running. You know, she got drenched to the bone. She magically happened to have his phone number written down on a piece of paper. Her phone died. She called him. She got back to his place and, you know, they kind of like peeled off her soaking wet clothes. And, um, you know, he put his hands on her and she moved his hand away and, um, uh, he then persisted and did it again. And she told us about how, 
you know, body language had always been her way of communicating. Um, she did, in fact, ask him to stop at one point in time, and, and he didn't. And um, he raped her. And, um, you know, one way to think about what happened to her is through, you know, this man's fundamental denial of her sexual citizenship. But another is to realize that the campus geography drove her off campus into Brooklyn looking for a suitable partner, someone she thought would be someone who she could talk to and who would find her attractive. And where so many students could just sort of like flip open their phone, well, I guess nobody flips open their phone anymore, turn <laughs> on their phone and you know, call a ride sharing app and be zipped back to campus when they were uncomfortable. She was stuck out in the middle of Brooklyn with the subway running sporadically. It was going to take her about two hours to get home. She was in a profoundly difficult situation, in part because of class and race dynamics. We also tell a story in the book of a young man named Carl, who, um, like many men, had um, an outsized fear of false accusation. False accusation is not very common, but it was very common for men to fear um, such false accusations. And Carl's an African-American man, and he told us a story about meeting this woman at a party, and she wanted to go back to his room, and he assessed that she wasn't sober enough. And so he walked her around campus and the surrounding areas for a while. Eventually, they went back to his room. He still thought, like, I'm not sure she's 100% sober. And so he refused to do anything for another kind of long period of time. Eventually, he consented to have sex with her. And they had sex. And um, afterwards, he recorded her on his phone saying what a good time she'd had. And as he recounted this story, he said to us, well, you know, New York is a one-party consent state. So he literally looked up the laws of the state of New York to make sure that he could make that recording without her permission and it would be admissible in court. Now, Carl's fear here of what could happen to him when having sex with a white woman where maybe things could be turned around on him, as he said, was partially this overblown masculine fear of, of, of this sort of like, in some ways, mythic thing that's happening. But it's also fundamentally tied to race. It's fundamentally tied to his concerns about the ways in which racialized outcomes within the um, criminal system would be biased against him. And so, you know, when Jennifer and I see these kinds of stories, what we see are the many ways in which power over control of space, power relative to class inequality, power relative to race inequality is incredibly important. We haven't touched even on sexuality here. It's another major dimension in the book. And so, you know, the penultimate chapter of the book is called Gender and Beyond. And we don't deny the incredible importance of gender dynamics for understanding sexual assault but we sort of want to place it within a broad understanding of power and inequality in American society and think about how it intersects with those multiple inequalities. Mm -hmm. This is also, I hate to say it, it's what makes it so hard to address. Sexual assault is not one thing. We're not going to have a magic bullet that fixes this. We're going to need to have multi-pronged, multi-sectoral approaches. To get back to the driving analogy, it's like driving. We can't just teach young people when they drive to stop at stop signs. I mean, that's going to help them. It's, you know, it's certainly not a bad thing. But there are lots of other things that we need, like seatbelts and education about the use of alcohol and not driving and making sure that the physical spaces that they're driving through actually promote safe driving rather than harmful driving. And so, you know, from a legislative and from a community perspective, We've got to think along multiple dimensions and maybe take advantage of a range of alliances that we haven't really considered as much in trying to transform this issue. That was deeply meaningful. And you, there's so many things that I was just writing because you kept saying things that really made me think about, you know, other stories and other ideas and just the intersectionality of all of these dynamics and how, how infrequently we really talk about these things. And, and just to go back to something you said earlier, you know, whenever I'm talking about um, sexual assault or about rape or about harassment, I always do this overcorrection of like, 
I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm talking about it from a place of like, I know mostly it's women that are affected by it, right? And I'm, and I'm, I, but I'm also hyper aware of the fact that it, men are impacted by it too. But I do this overcorrection of it where I'm like, and men too. And, and like, I'm always trying to include them. And you know, even though I know it's right, right? I, I have to stop for a moment. I have to think about like, am I doing damage to the issue by by doing that because I want people to understand that this is an issue that is mainly something that is affected by and, and that is experienced by women because because everywhere you go all day long if you the moment that you walk outside of your house as a woman it, I mean you could turn the corner and you could be harassed you could get to work and be almost either threatened with assault or, or assaulted you could live in a, in a, in a home where you, you know, it's not safe for you. There's so many different dynamics. I mean, and you don't even, you don't have to walk very far to experience it. And so that was a really important thing that you said that really just touched on a blind spot that I had. And so thank you for that. Um, one other thing I want to just share is that, well, also for those of you who are, who are tuning in and who are a part of this conversation, I want to just remind you that you can absolutely submit your questions into the Q&A portion. Um, we're going to get to that in a few moments. So we will pull those questions and we will start asking them. Um, but I want to just really tie this together with the storytelling because the book, having all the stories as part of the, as part of the book makes it human, right? And so in the ability to share our stories with one another, I believe that that is the way, as you said, that we remove the fear. And I want to share a story with everyone here, if I may, just for a moment. You know, right after we, we were coming out of the legislative session, we're on the heels of passing some of the strongest sexual harassment protections in the country, right? We're all excited about it. The New York Times is covering it. And we get back to the district office, right? Because we have an Albany office, district office. We're in the district office. And, you know, we're having meetings all day long. And again, the office space, even though we know it's a space where harassment happens or assault can happen, you're not really on guard that way. And so I sit down, about to have a meeting. And actually, Karen from my team, who is participating um, today, um, was in the meeting. She sat down across from me. We sat down and we were about to start the meeting. And this very tall, um, white male developer sits down and he says, before we get started, I just want to tell you um, two things. The first thing is inappropriate and the second is appropriate. So I just looked at him and he says, the first one, inappropriate, you are very beautiful. And the second is that your, your grandparents would be very proud of you, very like demeaning. So I just looked at him and I, we got back to work. Now, I eventually called him afterwards and I said to him that thing that you said to me in my office was inappropriate it made me feel uncomfortable and are you familiar with some of the work that I that I actually did this year and what I actually care about and I didn't do it again right to say like how dare you because I could have done that that would have been that would have felt really good but I wanted to transform his thinking and it's hard to, to feel that way when you feel like you've been harmed but I also knew I had an opportunity to do it because in the moment, even, even someone like myself who passed those laws, who's part of the conversation, it's still hard. It's still hard to witness what you're witnessing. It, it's a little bit surreal. It kind of makes your mind jumbled for a second. And sometimes you'll have the words available and sometimes you won't. And so I wanted to share that as just um, an opportunity for everyone just to know, just because, right, my name's on the bill, we had this conversation, does not mean that I don't find myself in situations sometimes where I'm thinking to myself, how did, how did, did that person really just say that? But what I'm committed to now is showing up in a way to redefine the space, to have those conversations and that dialogue, to change the thinking of the people who interact with me, and also to set boundaries for them to know, you cross that line again, you will not have access to this office. And it's a really different place than where I started from last year, right? I definitely would have thought like, I'm tough, I got this. You are put into a lot of different situations that you are not prepared for. Nobody taught you that. So this book is such a um, amazing way to learn more of that and to understand how to be a sexual citizen and really how to just be part of prevention. And so thank you both. It is, it is just, it's an honor to be in conversation with you because you are the experts in this. And I learned a tremendous amount reading the book as well as just sitting here and listening to you um, both now. Wow, thank you so 